starting the webinar now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Activity Strong Executive Edition webinar. My name is Megan McMahon, and I am the Director of Strategic Development here at Link Senior. For today's webinar, we are providing one free NAB, NCAP, NCCDP, NCTRC, and NZSRDT CEU credit. To be eligible for those CEU credits, you do need to remain on this webinar for the full hour. At the end of the event today, I will provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the webinar room chat box, and I will also send it by email to you this afternoon. Please be sure to check your spam folder. This CEU survey must be completed by midnight Eastern time on Thursday this week. If you have any questions, please email us at webinars at linkseniorcom The CEU certificates will be issued by email before the end of the day on Friday, March 4th. I will now go ahead and ha hand it over to Charles D. Vilmorin, CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Charles? Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you for, uh, thank you for this introduction. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Charles de Vermoen. I'm the, as Megan mentioned, the CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. This is uh, one of our Activity Strong webinars. I'm very excited to, uh, to welcome you on the first day of March, which is the first day of the month of women, Women's Month. And we have an amazing program titled A Quiet Revolution, Ensuring Meaningful Care and Engagement Through Innovative Leadership. And uh, Jackie, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, I want, I'd love you to um, join me in welcoming Jackie, who currently resides in the UK, but believe it or not, right now she's joining us from the best country in the world, which is my country, which is France. So Jackie, thank you so much. Jackie happens to be invited as a speaker and contributor to a conference in Lille, which is a, a city we were just talking about a, a few seconds before in the north of France. So Jackie, welcome. Our thank webinar you. is, yeah, thank you. I, I can't wait to hear your presentation, Jackie. Um, as a quick reminder, Activity Strong is this initiative uh, started and led by Link Senior in partnership with Activity Connection, NAP and NCAP, and as a uh, quick reminder, the executive edition um, is an invitation for the executives in the senior living industry, so executive director, administrators, corporate people, to come and join us in this fascinating discussion of how we elevate the experience of our elders, how we acknowledge, empower, and educate our amazing activity in life from Richmond professionals. So just a Quick slides of background before getting to the program. As I mentioned, my name is Charles. Um, I do believe all people are cool, and there's a special announcement about this initiative at the end. Jackie knows about it. Jackie's smiling, but we're very excited about something cool happening on March 9th. And um, you know, as I mentioned, all people are cool is this initiative that we started seven years ago for a number of reasons, but you know, the most important one is that we're not a fan of this segregation based on age. And as you, uh, as some of you are well aware, Activity is Strong, we started unfortunately almost two years ago. And I say unfortunately just because it's now been almost two years that we have been navigating this pandemic. Um, Link Senior, the company behind uh, some of this work is the company that I had the uh, privilege to co-found uh, 15 years ago, we're based in Washington, D.C. We work with amazing providers. Uh, the common denominator to, to these providers are the fact that they care, they care for their elders and their residents, and also their team members. So if you have any interest in exploring further what Link Senior could do in terms of helping you elevate your engagement efforts, your um, you know, building better and more person-centered programming in a measurable way, please feel free to reach out to us. We're very proud of our work. I'm very proud of the fact that we are a quote-unquote evidence-based platform with work that was published in a peer-reviewed journal. So that's the quick introduction, sorry, background. Now, let me get into the introduction. So um, we, we were introduced actually to Jackie um, uh, quite a few months ago 
by a connection that has already been on our platform called Ashton Applewhite, which, if some of you are aware of her work, is one of the leader and most vocal person in the field of um, anti-ageism. And so Jackie came recommended from Ashton, and so we interacted a lot, and we thought it would be an amazing um, experience for, for us all, predominantly now in North America, to learn from another uh, perspective, very um, thoughtful, deep perspective of Jackie uh, when it comes to the British system, right? So the, the quick word of introduction that I thought here is just a reminder that most of us, if not all of us, get up at, you know, every day and we are passionate about improving the life of our elders and I think that it's a great reminder for us to think about that what we do, resident engagement, is all about collaborating to make sure that each of these individuals, each of these elders, have an opportunity to collaborate with us and find purpose every day, to be dignified, to be respected, and again, to have access to this basic human right, which is purpose. So with that, um, Jackie, Marshall Cyrus is the director of Jackie Marshall Cyrus and Associates. Jackie, and it's an immense pleasure to, uh, to have you today on our platform. Please feel free to take it away. I'll move it to uh, your slides and feel free to direct me. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles, and, and your team for this very kind invitation to speak with you today and a very warm good afternoon to the audience. I hope you're all safe and well, and thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I've been asked, Charles, if you can do the next slide, please. I've been asked to share an overview of the UK's healthcare system to talk about a quiet revolution that's slowly gaining momentum here and to share some thoughts with you on how innovative leadership can change the dynamics of care and engagement. But my aim ultimately secretly is to inspire, influence and embolden as many of you as possible in whatever sphere you are situated for the common good. So I'll quickly give you a bit of background as to, to the UK's healthcare system. So our National Health Service, which we endearingly call the NHS, was the product of years of hard work and motivation from various political figures who felt the healthcare system at that time was insufficient and needed to be revolutionized. The imperative was that in Britain, health provisions was a growing problem and something had to be done to provide good, strong, and reliable healthcare for all. Understandably, there were, there were a lot of anxieties, um, which is inevitable in such a great and novel undertaking, uh, which hindered its gestation. However, on July the 5th, 1948, an historic moment occurred in British history. That was when the National Health Service was born. This meant that people no longer had to pay for medical attention when they needed it and paid instead collectively as taxpayers. The NHS therefore improved accessibility and distributed what was there more fairly. An NHS constitution was established and that ensured that the NHS belonged to the people of Britain. It set out their rights, the rights to which patients, the public and staff are entitled, as well as pledges, which the NHS is committed to achieve together with its responsibilities, which were owed to one another to ensure that it operated fairly and effectively. We also have a handbook to the NHS constitution, which is renewed at least every three years. And the requirements for renewal of this handbook are legally binding. 
there are seven guiding principles inherent to the NHS constitution. Charles, if you can get to the next slide for me, please. And these seven guided principles are as follows, that the NHS is for everyone, that it will not treat anyone unfairly because of their gender, their race, disability or ability, their age, sexual orientation, religion, belief, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternal or marital or civil partnership status. The N all NHS services are free of charge, except in limited circumstances. And some people, some members of the public have to pay for their prescriptions. It provides high quality care that is safe, effective and focused on the patient's experience through its commitment to innovation and on the promotion, conduct, and use of research. So all healthcare delivered in the NHS is meant to be heavily evidence-based. Another principle is that it should support people to look after and manage their own health and to have choices about their care and the services they access. Patients with their families and carers where appropriate will be involved in and consulted on all decisions about their care and treatment. The NHS is actively encouraging feedback from the public. It is meant to welcome it and to use it to improve its services. The fifth principle is that it must work in partnership with other organizations to provide good quality health care. The sixth principle is that it is committed to spending taxpayers' money carefully and only in ways that make things better for patients. Public funds for healthcare will be devoted solely to the benefit of the people and the NHS that the NHS serves. And the final principle is that the NHS will show people how it makes decisions. The system of responsibility and accountability for taking decisions should be transparent and clear to the public, patients, and the staff. The government is there to ensure that there is always a clear and up-to-date statement of the NHS, NH, NHS's accountability for this purpose. So therefore, from its inception, the NHS was underpinned by accountability and engagement with the public as taxpayers. Uh, the next slide, please. In 2014 and 2017, the UK's National Health Service was declared the world's best healthcare system. It ranked first out of 11 countries in an international report at Commonwealth Fund on Healthcare Systems. It was compared to systems in the US, Switzerland, Sweden, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Canada, New Zealand, Norway, and Australia. We were ranked first overall, first for care processes, such as coordination, patient involvement and engagement and prevention, and we were ranked first for equity, which is a comparison of performance for higher and lower income individuals. We also scored highly in terms of getting value out of the money the UK taxpayer put in. In 2021, last year, we lost the accolade that we had held for seven years. We fell from first to fourth place in a survey of healthcare in 11 wealthy countries and were ranked ninth in the comparison of healthcare outcomes. This year, in CEO World Magazine's Healthcare Index, which is a statistical analysis of the overall quality of healthcare systems, which includes infrastructure, professional competencies, cost, quality, medicine availability, and government readiness, we ranked 10th. 
Many people often think that the NHS is a single organization as it began as a national system. However, the health, UK's healthcare system is really comprised of four separate healthcare systems. The NHS in England, health social services and public safety in Northern Ireland, NHS Scotland and NHS Wales representing the four nations of the UK. The UK government sets out the overall budget according to the NHS in England, while it provides block grants to the other three nations under which their legislatures determine how much of that block grant to spend on their healthcare system. The next slide, please, like, um, Charles. Basically, the healthcare system in England looks something like this. Some changes have been made in recent times where in August 2020, the Public, Public Health England was scrapped less than six months after the COVID-19 pandemic began and was merged with the NHS Test and Trace Program and the UK's Joint Bioscience Centre. People literally left work in one organisation on an afternoon and returned to work in another the next morning. Such was the pace of change. NHS trusts are public sector bodies established by the Secretary of State for Health to provide healthcare services to the NHS. They have a board of executive and non-executive directors accountable to the state. Next, next slide, please, Charles. The healthcare system in Wales, although not illustrated here, holds public engagement genuinely at the heart of the Welsh healthcare system. A Healthier Wales, which is the Welsh government's long-term plan for health and social care, identifies public engagement as a key priority and as a principle for the design of the health and care system. It commits the NHS in Wales and the social care system to the development of new models of health and care and to reshaping services and to introduce a different type of relationship between the citizen and the health and social care system. Many localities in Wales boast citizen panels made up of local residents who give their views on key consultation topics throughout the year. The next slide, please, Charles. In Scotland, public involvement is an integral part of their healthcare delivery system and a number of organizations exist with a remit to ensure meaningful engagement to healthcare, to ensure that healthcare organizations learn from the experiences of patients and carers, that healthcare services are sensitive to the needs and preferences of patients, and to enable the public to review the quality of the services the NHS provides. Next slide, please. The healthcare system in Northern Ireland is also underpinned by stakeholder engagement. The Health, Social Services and Public Safety Department is responsible for both health and social care, which differentiates it from the other three national systems, which are responsible only for healthcare. The department is organized under permanent secretary with five business groups, five medical professional groups, and an agency. There are also five regional trusts, which are responsible for their own budgets and the management of frontline staff, health, and social care services. Today, the NHS in the UK, in all nations, are in crises. The system which was once the world's best is now heralded as broken at home and abroad. The issues of funding and demand continue to rise and the ability to provide free healthcare to all is a continuous topic of debate for many. Nothing incites the passions of the British public more than threats, 
or moves to privatize even the smallest portions of any of its services. It is an NHS that despite its challenges, continues to be much loved and cherished by the British people. So much so that inevitably it's become a very powerful political tool and ensuring its viability lay at the very heart of the UK's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, this was at the expense of social care, often deemed the country cousin to the NHS healthcare system in England. Next, next slide, please. Adult social care in the UK is an entirely different kettle of fish to the NHS healthcare system. Unlike healthcare, it is not free at the point of use. Support from the state is reserved for those with the highest level of needs and the lowest financial means. This means that many people must fund or pay for their care needs themselves. In England, although heavily regulated, public engagement is far less enshrined in adult social care and even less so in long-term care in comparison to the NHS healthcare system. Adult social care is often broken down into two broad categories. Next slide, please, Charles. Long-term care and short-term care. Both are arranged by local authorities and are described as formal care. Short-term care refers to packages of care that are time limited with the in intention of maximizing someone's independence and eliminating their need for ongoing support. Long-term care refers to services provided on an ongoing basis and range from high intensity services like nursing care to low intensity services such as community support. Social care is an, an even worse crisis. And we, have, we now have what is described by commentators as the worst workforce disaster in living memory as exhausted carers quit the sector in their tens of thousands. We have an astonishing 120,000 jobs unfilled in England alone. Commentators point to a catastrophic cocktail of low wages, staff burnout, mandatory COVID jabs, and post-Brexit immigration rules as having brought the industry to its knees. But in my humble opinion, it was already well and truly on its way there. What we consistently failed to take into consideration was the European CSR. CSR stand means care, carer support ratio. And this is defined as the number of potential caregivers aged between 45 and 64, which is the most common caregiving age group for each person aged 80 plus. This is the group of older adults most at risk of needing long-term services. The fact is that it had been in a steady decline from six to one in 2011, meaning six carers to one individual and projected to be two to one by 2050. This was ignored, largely ignored. And while the carer support ratios are available for a number of European countries, it was very hard going for me to find the carer support ratio available in the UK. What we do know is that over 1.4 million older adults, that's one in seven people, do not have access to all the care and support they need. In 2050, that's in 28 years time, I will be 86 years of age. I, my contemporaries, 
and likely many of you listening will also be within that so-called high-risk group. We will be faced with the prospect of institutional care or whatever the system deteriorates into. I'm almost certain of two things. One, we will have very little choice. And two, we will have to pay. And while we accept in the UK, while we accept institutionalization as a way of life and providing support for older citizens on the basis of age and their medical conditions, very few of us can fathom it for ourselves. While it may be gratefully accepted and or welcomed by some, the long-term care system is not any less broken because a few expounds its virtues. Our research shows that it is not the setting or the circumstance or existence more than 80% of British people want for themselves. We will be faced with a model of care that is a relic of the early 19th century and before that. And so in looking forward, being future facing, I issued this call to arms. Charles, can you please play the video? Yes, and what I'm going to do, uh, Jackie, I just want to make sure that I'm sharing the sound. So let me unshare and share again. Yeah. And here is the video. Hello. My name is Jackie Marshall Cyrus, and I've been a nurse for 37 years. That said, I risk being judged a heretic for what I'm about to say, but I will speak my truth. Maya Angelou once said that there's no agony like bearing an untold story inside you, and I would like to share my story with you today. We have a social problem in this country, one we refuse to acknowledge, or accept or address. And that problem is the systematic warehousing of our citizens in institutions on the basis of their age and health needs. The foundation of this practice was laid in 1834, one year after Britain officially abolished slavery. As a society, we have come so far in terms of race sexual orientation and gender equality. Yet, this bastion of inequality in terms of age remains largely unchanged, but more importantly, unchallenged. We have created a system characterized by the unrelenting suffering of many, grateful acceptance by some, and huge profits for a few. Many dedicated healthcare professionals have left the system because they were so shocked and disillusioned by the way it really works when you get under the hood. You most likely know very little of the underworld of which I speak, except through investigative television programs. Do not think for one moment that what you saw were exceptions to the rule. They were not. All of us, regardless of our differences, are united by one thread, old age. We will all advance in years. No one is exempt. It's part of our life cycle. Do you want to be the product instead of the customer? Do you want to be lost along a corridor with no one to love? nothing to live for and nothing to do? Do you want to simply exist with no one knowing what is happening to you behind an iron cloak of concealment? I don't. I want to live to the fullest until my last breath 
I want to choose where I live and where I die. To each and every one of you, I say, I have seen what lies beneath that cloak of concealment. Trust me, you do not want to be there. On behalf of our future selves, we have it in our power to change course, to dispel the fear of growing older and to live out our lives as whole human beings. In the words of Amanda Gorman, for there is always light if we are only brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. I ask you to join me and my friends to be bold, to be brave, and to be this revolution. Okay, Charles. Are you hearing me, Charles? Yes, I am. And I changed to the next slide. Is that what you want me to do? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I see some people were having difficulties hearing the video. Please feel free to contact me. I, I will certainly send it to you. And thank you for the lovely comments. Jackie's revolution is my instinct to act. Recently, someone asked me, why, why Jackie's revolution? Why have you for the last 15 years been so unrelenting, trying to change the way we look after people in advanced stages of their lives in Britain? Why are you risking your nursing registration to call out this social problem, as you call it? Why do you merely eke out a living to be on this mission when you could be doing far more lucrative work with your level of expertise? Why are you putting yourself at point blank range of those who have vested interests in the system? Because I cannot breathe. Because someone must lift the cloak of concealment because it is not what people want and it is not what their families deserve. Because most people do not want this way of life for themselves in the future. And because my 38 years of clinical nursing experience and management experience have led me to one indefatigable philosophy. It is that growing older should not cost anyone what it means to be human. I'm leading Jackie's revolution because I am suffering inside. In quiet moments, on long drives, sitting in airports or in GP waiting rooms or cooking in my kitchen, I am consumed with a deep sense of grief and injustice that I must quell. I cannot unsee the man in his room who covered all the mirrors with plain A4 sheets of paper because he could not bear to see what he had become. I cannot unsee the men and women entering the system, entering institutions with a single suitcase, their lives boiled down to a single suitcase to live essentially in four walls. I still see men and women awakened at 4 a.m. every morning to be washed so that they can spend long days with nothing to do, nothing to live for, and no one to love. I see men and women duped by agents of the state or by loved ones into entering institutional care under the guise of family going on holiday never to return. 
I hear the shrieks of sorrow and despair in the recesses of my mind. I see them dwindle into objects of care. I see people willing themselves to die. Right now, my fear of retribution has been overwhelmed by my instinct to act. The history of institutionalization as a way to look after old, older adults in Britain began in 936 when King Athelstan funded the first arms house in York. We had 500 years of arms houses in this country, in Britain. In 1601, the act of relief for the poor, now known as the Old Poor Law, made it every parish in England's responsibility to house people who could not work on the basis of age or whether they were ill. A significant proportion was aged. Then we had a further 200 years of little change until 1834, when the Poor Law Amendment Act came into being. Under this act, the state was meant to recognize its responsibility to look after the sick, poor, and old citizens. In the, late, in the late 1800s, we saw the advent of the workhouse where half of the institutionalized population were older adults. Almost a hundred years later on, in 1930, workhouses were the only way to support the poor, the old, and infirm. Was, it was officially abolished. What followed thereafter, and to the present day, I can only describe as a plethora of care acts, health acts, commissioned reports, consultative documents, green papers, white papers, plans, reviews. 188 years, almost two centuries later, the intractable issues of quality of care, standards, regulation, funding, workforce, recruitment, retention, wages, culture, education remain unresolved. The 21st century has brought additional issues of unrelenting profiteering, human rights breaches, do not attempt resuscitation orders, and COVID-19 which saw over 60,000 older adults in institutions in the UK lose their lives before their time. Mind you, I am well aware these challenges do not only exist in the UK, they exist in most developed countries where the institutional model is the framework for care in advanced stages in life. Mark Drafer, the Welsh politician in 2006, stated, the future of private provision is set to be one of large scale warehousing, physically located on fewer premises and offering little by the way of choice. In, process, in the process, large, not to say grotesque profits will have been made by a handful of individuals on the basis that yet further profits are to be extracted from the sector. The world of equity specialists, venture capitalists and buyer deals may seem remote from the day-to-day -day operations of social welfare and of social policy and analysts. Yet the line that links the person sitting in the day room and the person in the boardroom is a direct one and the language that it speaks is of cash flows more than care and quality of earnings more than quality of life or quality of service. We have commodified human beings on the basis of age, healthcare, lack of power, lack of choice. For me, it is as simple as that. System change is not on the government's agenda 
as it's in the too difficult to do box, too entrenched and will be too disruptive. It's a mindset evident in major healthy aging initiatives supported by millions of pounds of investment in the UK. The aim is to keep people in their own homes for longer. So when it's deemed you've come to the point where it's no longer possible for you to be in your home, to remain independent, what happens? The default position for the majority of people is to be uprooted from your home, whether you wish it or not, so you can get the care that you need. Forget about the life you want. Forget about your aspirations and your dreams. Forget about your sexuality and your desire for intimacy and love. You become two things henceforth, an object of care and a commodity. Next slide, please, Charles. The vision is to give people in advanced years of life what they truly deserve as human beings, irrespective of their age and of medical science. On the 5th of July in 1948, Anurin Bevan gave us a legacy built upon a long held ideal that good health should be available to all, regardless of wealth, that legacy was the NHS. Jackie's revolution holds the ideal that people deserve to be able to live out their lives and die in their own homes or wherever they choose, irrespective of their age and or medical condition. Next slide, please. We have a determination to make this happen. And I refuse to accept that this vision is impossible. It is only impossible because no one has done it yet. Next slide, please. What is the key to unlocking this great and novel undertaking of our time? To realizing the culmination of this bold and pioneering move to make care in later life, what it really should be, where it should be, and how it should be? How do you put an end to civic malaise on a national and global scale? How do you get people to face up to the reality or reality they'd rather not face up to or cross that bridge when they reach it? How do you harness the creativity of innovators policymakers, investors, and taxpayers to go back to the drawing board and start reinventing new ways for the future. It only begets more questions. We do not have all the answers. We cannot have all the answers, but we have purpose. We have resolve and we have courage. We have conscience and we are growing in number. No single key could ever unlock centuries old tradition. It's a whole big bunch of keys. And first among them is innovative leadership. I say innovative leadership because that is what this task demands. Innovative thinking is a skill and it's the skill of the future. And by definition, innovative thinking is the ability to come up with novel approaches to problems the goal of which is to make positive change, to tackle complex problems and to make something completely different. And by nature, it is risky. It demands a different type of leadership. Next slide, please. There is another key, one that is crucial to any system change. You will call it engagement. And every sector has a slightly different take on engagement. I believe engagement is necessary, but it is not sufficient. I believe it needs to put citizens in a much stronger position of self-determination, autonomy, and power. It needs to move people to the head of the queue, where the action really is, where they become critical and participatory. 
where it places them in a position that captures their mental capital and makes them co-designers in the process and development of change. People need to be partners, co-founders, co-designers, collaborators, co-decision makers, and co-creators. It is a brave organization that takes engagement to another level and moves it beyond the conventional understanding, rhetoric, and dynamics. Jackie's revolution will be characterized by a fleet of nine ships. Leadership, partnership, ownership, kinship, citizenship, fellowship, companionship, relationships, in order to create a flagship. We will show that it can be done because the best way to predict our future, if ever we can, is to invent it. We have new tools, new clues, new socioeconomic contexts. We live, we have a new worldview, so we can start solving a centuries old problem. I just want to leave you with some key thoughts. Charles, the next slide, please. These words of Winston Churchill, we must not lose our faculty to dare, particularly in dark days, resonate today more than ever. In the face of ad ad adversity and uncertainty, let us be steadfast in our resolve to be the generation that will make our future brighter and that of our children and grandchildren less fearful of older age and more empowering of them. If the wind will not serve, take to the oars. Change and resistance walk hand in hand. We must be able to recognize and accept when the prevailing wind does not serve us. We must be willing to take control of our destinies, to put our hands to the wheel and our backs to the wind. The essential quality of life is change and change is evolution. Static is the enemy of change and therefore our implacable enemy. It remains within our power to do something that our future selves will thank us for and to bring our, our lives to a meaningful conclusion. My mistake, according to Marcus Garvey, my mistake, you ask? Well, I tried to change the world without first changing the minds of men. He realized the importance of changing minds. My job is to speak the truth, to make the invisible visible, to touch your hearts, in the hope of changing how you see things, to scatter the seeds of possibility of a better stage in life so that others can plant it, nurture it. And whilst they may not come to fruition in our time, it is a legacy we ought to be leaving for following generations. Great leaders do not create followers. They create more leaders. Much has been written and researched and spoken about leadership. In my experience, it is a quality latent in all of us. It is like a spore waiting for the right conditions, the right cause, or the right person to fertilize that spore. When you strip it all back, you will find two bones, conscience, and courage. It is a, as good a place to start as any to create more leaders. And this is my purpose, because this is the only way the change that we become, that we deserve will come. I wish you and yours the very best going forward. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope I have inspired influence and embolden you to lead in whatever way you can in whatever you do 
and to do it in your own imitable style. Thank you very much. This was amazing, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was kind of a. It was it was amazing, Jackie. Uh, thank you so much for this this presentation. I don't know if you were able to uh, to see it through the chat, but many many people actually found it empowering, also beyond inspirational. So I want to thank you for offering this amazing uh, word of courage. As you might imagine, most of us are very kind of focused on where we are, like in the U.S. So having another perspective, I think, is just uh, is just very very useful. Um, you know, there's there's a couple of things that really resonated. I mean, obviously many of them, but a couple of things that really stood out is some of your elements that. Uh, that obviously believe in, which is this idea of choice, right? Like we, I think, I think it's Ashton Applewhite who has this quote that says that, you know, ageism is a detriment to our future self, right? And so if we are able to allow our elders to have choice, allow ourselves to have choice, then that's a great way to facilitate that, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. It's one of the key components of personhood that, that I see people being deprived of at every level, particularly when they get to the stage when they need advanced levels of care. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because it kind of, uh, anyway, for me personally, brings things kind of full circle because as I entered the world of aging as a career, I was made aware of the work of Tom Kitwood you know, which comes yes, from yes. England, which yes. defines, which was, I think, I think, the very first person to define personhood for people living with dementia, right? Yes, yes, yes. I remember, I, I've, I've met Professor Tom Cookwood, yeah, many yeah, times. Yeah, so that's, 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 no, no, but for me, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a nice connection. Yeah, yeah, so the other yeah. thing also that resonated several times in what you were saying, especially at the end, is this idea of, uh, innovative leadership right like we we all had we all have um agency right now i do have a quick question because sometimes we do have that and it, it kind of came up at least in two webinars this year mm -hmm. how would you um you know encourage people that work in communities like in long-term care home to consider the agency they have could you make it that slightly more digestible or help them understand or help us understand how anyone actually has, can be innovative there? I think to be innovative, you, 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 you can address it at, at a micro level and you can address it at a macro level that is, you know, senior executive management. To, to be innovative at, at a micro level, it means, you know, essentially realizing the reality, the truth, the truth of the circumstances, the reality of the issues you face. It requires a certain amount of, of support from management, um, you know, people who were carers, a personal care, often find it very difficult to, to give their ideas you know, um, to, to share ideas for change, how things could be done better. Um, mm. There's a concept called frugal innovation, which means it doesn't take a lot of money to do things. You know, people can, can creatively do things with no money. It's just a change of perspective of how things can be done. If you're working on the shop floor, as we call it, within settings, it's important. It makes the job easier if management, and I go back again to leadership, you must have buy-in. You know, the, your leaders, your managers 
must embrace and accept and encourage new ideas and creativity. And one of the things I always go back to when I started working for the UK's Innovation Agency, within a month of joining that organization, I was sent on, on a, a four-day residential program to around creative thinking and problem solving. Now, when I worked in the NHS, I was always the rebel, the rebel nurse, the rebel sister. You know, I always did things differently yeah. and stuff. And yeah. And I thought, oh, okay, they're sending me on a creative thinking and problem solving course. Let me, let me see what this is about. And it changed my life those four days, I walked away from that course with a much different approach, open, open to, to other views, the ability to see things from a different perspective, the ability to engage and to influence people to see how things could be different and, and how to think left field, left field. And I think that is one of those are two key things that that managers or leaders should try to build capability of in, in their communities, build the capability of your team to think creatively and to solve problems. Yeah, you know, I, I, I do really enjoy this idea of frugal innovation. Um, you know, we, we we at Link Senior started, as I mentioned, the uh, Old People Are Cool initiative. And I mean, in the end, it's just words, right? They're just words. And we didn't put, I mean, it wasn't like a big initiative that we started. I mean, cost-wise at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the other comment, and then we can wrap up in a few seconds here, but the other comment that really stood out for me, mm -hmm. and actually it's right here again, Great leaders do not create followers, they create more leaders, which you just referred to, right? Which is this ability um, of inspiring others and just empowering other people. So mm -hmm. I do have one last question. And in the meantime, I'll also share your contacts so people can feel free to, to, uh, to be in touch with you, Jackie. But, you know, if anyone is interested in joining your revolution, and I'm sure I, I would expect that a lot of us are. Anyway, I want it. Um, what can we wish you for, like in the next year or so? What would you like to do with your revolution? Tell me something that would be cool uh, achieved in, a, in, say, a year or so. What would be, be cool for me? Well, the, the, the end goal is to, to have a demonstrator site, and we're working with the mm -hmm. Welsh government um, okay. in Wales to, to, to that end. Um, very receptive. They're very, they're very, they have a huge appetite for, for Jackie's revolution. They have a huge appetite for the vision. And, you know, we're in talks with a number of, of what we call unusual suspects, you know. So apart from people in robotics and artificial intelligence, we're working with people in advanced materials. We're working yep. with people in terrestrial space applications. But what I would like to, to have is uh, what we call a sand pit, which is a sort of residential sort of, of, of ideation factory to get people together to take them through this creative process, this problem solving process, so that we can start to peel away the layers of centuries old thinking around this concept of long-term care and, and, and get to the core of it and, and start imagining and build, building something, something new, something different. So that's, that's my chief aim, to, to get um, an organization or somebody to, to, to help us enable that, build that capability. That's an ambitious goal, and we yeah. all need and want ambitious goal. And I wish you the best for this goal, Jackie. Anything that we can do to help you, please let us know. And thank you again for such an amazing presentation today. It has been my pleasure. And thank you to everybody out there. Thank you, Regina, Julian. Thank you for the lovely comments. It's been wonderful. Marjorie, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy it's your time in France, Jackie. And... Um, yeah, thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you very for much. For audience, yeah, anytime. 
for our audience, I just had a couple quick announcements that I do want to share, which is that um, Jackie was very kind enough to collaborate with us in doing one of these tip sheets. So please feel free to come to our website or go to our Facebook page or consider the link that is being dropped in our chat today to have access to it. As I shared, Jackie would love for you to be in touch, so please be in touch if you have any questions or follow-up items for her presentation today. In terms of fighting ageism, right, we also wanted to share something super cool if you have not been uh, made aware of that. There is this amazing professional, a life enrichment activity professional in Texas, in Houston, Texas, by the name of Edward Kraft. And Edward contacted us at Link Senior a few weeks ago. And as you can see, he's posing now with the Old People Accord t-shirt. Edward had a project which was to um, help create within its, facility, within its community sorry, a fashion show on March 9th. And to celebrate this fashion show, he even went through the process of meeting with the mayor of Houston, and they have agreed to proclaim March 9th as Old People Are Cool Day, which for probably the 10th time sends me goosebump. I am so excited about that. So, Edward, if you're on the line, if you're listening to this, congratulations from all of us at Link Senior and our audience. And for our audience, please consider joining the amazing event that Edward and his team will be hosting on March 9th, which is a fashion show to raise awareness that beauty and fitness does not stop at, uh, at any age. And then it's done, it is done in partnership with this community called the Landing at Augusta, which is a frontier management community. And it's in partnership with Fabletics, Great Age Movement, and obviously Link Seniors, Old People Are Cool. Jackie, thank you again. Everybody, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Have very a wonderful much. day. And Jackie, enjoy the rest of your evening. I will. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thank you so Bye, much, Jackie.